Hello everybody, it's Monday and you know what that means, it's time for an OTR Central Q&A video and thanks to all of you that took to Twitter and tweeted your hashtag OTR Central questions, both wrestling and non-wrestling related. I appreciate it, so let's go ahead and see how many of I, these I can get through in the next 14 or 15 minutes or so. JJ the Great 15 kicks us off with... Would you have been okay with Sasha Banks in the Rumble? <laughs> now, before you lambaste this idea, imagine her tossing Ziggles. <laughs> Can I get three claps and a fucked off Ziggler to kick this bitch off? <laughs> fucked off Ziggler! Now, you'd have been bringing her in just expressly and specifically for that stated purpose, then that would have been se magnifique. However, no. We'd rather her just have been on television. <laughs> That's a good place to start. But the the thought, the idea of her tossing off out Dolph Ziggler, again, <laughs> fuck Dolph Ziggler. That I'd be okay with. Cyrus Sepper, do you think it's possible that AJ Styles was brought in to replace Daniel Bryan for hardcore fans? I don't know if it was directly a thing where he's going to take over for Daniel Bryan's spot or what would have been Daniel Bryan's spot. I mean, they have other guys that appeal to that similar fan base, the Kevin Owenses of the world, the Seth Rollins of the world, even though he's hurt, the Dean Ambroses of the world, the Nevilles of the world. They have those guys that are actively already on the roster. Now, with AJ Styles, was he brought in to be an upper mid-card type of guy? Perhaps. Like I said, I'm, I'm taking a, a slow approach before I fully buy into WWE being fully committed to AJ Styles. I really am. Because you're talking about a 38-year-old dude that in a lot of ways, you know, he's not tremendous on the microphone. You know, he comes again from that background where he's been all over the world, so he has an established name, but WWE, on the one hand, wants to stick with that name. At the same token, they want to establish that they're the real kings. It'll be really interesting to see how it plays out in 2016 with AJ Styles. I don't think we should be running to go expect him to be getting the world championship anytime this year. Let's see, who do we got next? Um, let's see here. Abdullah Fish C, what would you recommend WWE should do to stop their talents getting injured, or is it the talent's fault? It's hard to necessarily just lay or place blame at the footstep or at the feet of a particular entity here, because some might say, well, it's the grind of the WWE schedule, but compared to the grind of the schedule now to 15, 20 years ago, it's not nearly as bad. Um... In terms of the talents, some of the unnecessary risks that they take in their matches to take shortcuts instead of trying to tell a real story and actually trying to really get over and try to make real money. They go for that quick kind of instant gratification that, frankly, unfortunately, too many of the hardcore fans like. You can play some of the blame there. I mean, you know, it, it, but sometimes shit's going to happen. If a guy took six months off, you know, to go get himself right and the first night back, he comes back jumps off of the top rope, and he tears his ACL. Is that anybody's fault? Sometimes shit happens. And that's the wrestling business. At the end of the day, shit happens. Shit happens. I mean, you know, it's like, for example, when Psycho Sid went up to that second rope of justice <laughs> and sit there and to deliver a big boot to Scott Steiner. Think about how many times an RVD has jumped off the top rope doing his kick or other people have done similar type of maneuvers and they've never had their leg go in three different directions. I mean, I just say... <laughs> so I don't know if you can say it's anybody's fault. Um, I would say that maybe it should teach some of these guys to not take so many risks with their body, but sometimes, you know, it's shit, you know, you, you do that much on a consistent basis, you're going to have shoulder problems, back problems, knee problems, hip problems, ankle problems, neck problems. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, what I advocate for in an off-season for the product, yeah, I've talked about that in, at length in the past. It's not a realistic thing based off of the uh, current WWE reality, but in an ideal world, yes, I would only have them work eight to nine months a year. Now, I think you could incorporate this in the sense of you give everybody three months off during the course of the year without ever have, actually having to take a break as a show. That, to me, I think is a way to go that could potentially save people and keep them healthier and fresher, both mentally and physically. 
Um, but I don't know if there's any one specific thing other than that that I can sit there and say is really going to prevent these injuries. Um, David Robinson, thoughts on Bailey being called up to the main roster? I didn't know she had been. But if she has been, okay, cool, I guess. We'll see what WWE does with her. We'll see. Alexander, with The Rock being a major part of Mania, do you think it'll be an all-Samoa title change this year? <laughs> uh, yeah, you probably have the Usos win the belt at WrestleMania, you would think. You would think, based off the way things are pointing. Roman Reigns being given the gift from God at WrestleMania 32 in the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So, yes, you could see a couple of Samoan title changes, as a matter of fact. Andy Booze! Has a good one. Who would you have AJ Styles face at WrestleMania 32? Who would I have him face? Not who should he face or who will the WWE have him face, but who would I have him face? Um, see, this would require me to know more about um, who he's worked with over the years. The safe bet, honestly would be Samoa Joe because you know there's chemistry there, you know there's familiarity there. So it would be a way to give a big match to both AJ Styles and Samoa Joe uh, at the same time, at the same point, leaving you confident that these guys will go out there and not stink up the joint, not look like a disconjoited or discombobulated mess on the biggest stage of the year. In an ideal world, if Samoa Joe was already on the roster, and that's part of the way this would have to work for me, if he was already on the roster, it would be AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe at WrestleMania 32. Yay, we're having old TNA title main events here, mid-carding WrestleMania. But again, you know, I want to spotlight AJ Styles in a big way. And I want to push him. I want to go forward with him in 2016. I want to make sure that he looks good at WrestleMania. And, you know, you could maybe throw in somebody like a Kevin Owens. You know, maybe that would work too, but... I don't know. I kind of like my idea a little bit better, frankly. And then Andy Booz also asked, do you think Golden State will equal or break the Bulls 72-10 and 10 record? If not, what record do you see them ending up with? I think it's very possible they could get to 70 wins. I, they might get to 72-10. and 10. So it doesn't mean that they're better than that 95-96 Bulls team. But I think it's possible. You know, we'll see if they start to lose a little bit of that fire in their belly uh, as the season progresses. The best thing that could frankly happen to the Golden State Warriors would be for the San Antonio Spurs to be hanging around in the tar in the range, so to speak, of them, even if it's a couple of games back for the top overall seed in the Western Conference playoffs. The longer the Spurs are in the mix, the more likely it would be that the Golden State Warriors would want to play the string out, and I think the more likely they would be to end up 72-10, and 10, which is still a phenomenal accomplishment. I mean, they're better than they were last year when they were hungrier, you would think in theory, because they hadn't won the championship yet. They were trying to prove that their style of basketball, their way, was a winning way, and they did prove it. Now they're even better, and it's scary. And I don't even know if they've played absolutely, truly their best basketball yet. That's what's really scary. Uh, Ryan Foster, do you think it's fair that people crap on The Rock for coming back only for WrestleMania but not The Undertaker? Um... <sighs> eh. I get where people would think that, and I can see that that does have some potential hypocrisy there to it. I mean, situations are different, whereas The Rock was gone for a large portion of the 2000s. I mean, we have to keep this in proper context. There was a many, many years stretch where The Rock was nowhere to be found where Undertaker only over the past few years has started to only show up for WrestleMania. It's also different. The Rock is The Rock, but The Undertaker is The Undertaker, and we're talking about respect levels. You know, Rock, a big star, huge star, international icon, but The Undertaker is the motherfucking Undertaker when it comes to the WWE. He's as the WWE as much as anybody, not named Vince K. McMahon, frankly. Um, so I think it's also one of those things, too, where... Yeah, I do think it's somewhat unfair, frankly. I, I mean, I really do. Uh, because at this point in time, this is, is going to be the sixth straight WrestleMania that The Rock's involved with. You know, why can't we just be happy that The Rock's there? Why do we need to crap on him for only showing up for Mania season? You know, it's beneficial that he's there. So why not enjoy it? It's not something we're going to get forever. It's something we know what it's like to not have seen for many, many years. So as a result, why not sit there and just enjoy it? 
you know, be happy about it. I guess that would be my whole thing about this. Uh, your mother's arse. With Sheamus, Finn Balor, and Becky in WWE, do you think it would be wise for WWE to put on a live event in Ireland? Now, live event, I think they usually do live events every year in Ireland, Dublin or somewhere, don't they? When they do their international tours and when they do their post-WrestleMania European tour, and I'm sure they're going to do one again this year. If you're talking about a pay-per-view, mm, let's get one in London first at Wembley. Let's get one there. Let's get a big four pay-per-view there. Then we'll start worrying about Ireland and other international destinations. Then he also asked, how would you package Matt Morgan if you were trying to make him a star in today's WWE? I wouldn't. I think he retired, didn't he? And we'll keep him that way. John Roy, thoughts on Lucha Underground doing a great job promoting their product by being on SportsCenter. I didn't know that they were on SportsCenter. I didn't know that they were featured on SportsCenter. That's cool. That's very cool. You know, I think Lucha, just like the other wrestling companies, could do a little bit of a better job trying to promote within professional wrestling. And here's, here's what I mean. This is going to sound a little arrogant and make me sound like I'm a little full of myself. But let's, let's be honest, I kind of am. But I think I have a valid point. There are people like me and other people like me with audiences close to my size, my size, and many people with audiences bigger than my size, that if I'm a company like that, I would think I would reach out to those people and I would want to extend an olive branch to those people and I would want to get those people at least somewhat involved in the process, even if it's just from a marketing and promotionary standpoint or promotional standpoint. I would want these guys' opinions. I would want these guys' thoughts. I would want these guys to be able to go out potentially to their thousands and thousands of followers that they have to be able to talk about the product or talk about this or talk about this highlight or talk about this hot thing and get some potential free or limited price advertising. It's one thing that's astounded me over the years, the five plus years of doing OTRS Central. It's one thing if a WWE is not reaching out to me. I understand that. I get that. They don't need me. But frankly, a company like an ROH, or especially a TNA, who for years I was doing Impact reviews for them, at no point in time did somebody from Impact Wrestling reach out to me and want my thoughts or opinions or want more clarification on something I maybe said or try to work out anything with me to where I would promote certain aspects of their product as long as I didn't feel like it compromised my credibility for doing this type of stuff. You know, it's one of these things where these companies live in their own bubble and they don't want to hear anybody say anything bad about them, but they never think about the thought that maybe they need somebody to say those type of things, those truthful type of things, because it'll help make them better. Furthermore, it's another missed opportunity to get more people on your side and to get more people potentially promoting your product. And that's a knock on Lucha Underground. I don't think they do a very good job of that because I frankly don't think anybody in the wrestling business, especially including the, even the WWE, does a very good job of that either. You know, only recently has the WWE kind of started to embrace the whole thing with the uh, Wrestling Observer Newsletter and PW Torch by actually issuing statements and responding to them and talking about rumors and announcing different things to them. And part of the reason I think they do that is because they know how incredibly hypocritical it is when they sit there and leak a lot of shit to TMC them damn selves. So on the one hand, they hate the gossip. But on the other hand, if it's under their control, they will sit there and promote the gossip. At least they've started to come out of their senses slowly a little bit about some of this as a company. But yeah, you would think that people like me, but like I said, people that have bigger audiences than me would sit there and reach out to me. Like, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, I think of a company like TNA, and I'm trying to think of somebody who has a bigger audience than me. Um, Bruce Blitz. Here's a perfect example. You know, he was a guy very critical of WWE. For a while there, loved TNA, was bending over backwards in his joy of TNA. I don't know if he still does or not. I frankly don't give a fuck. However, the point I'm getting at here is, here's a guy with a show that gets two to three times the audience of viewership that I've got. And at no point in time did it ever seem like TNA was reaching out to him. TNA was embracing him. TNA was trying to do something to partner with him to have him help promote their product. This is not just to pick on TNA because TNA is not the only company that does this. But it speaks to the stupidity and the incompetence from a marketing and promotion standpoint of the wrestling business as a whole. The more people, the more foot soldiers you have to get your message out, the better off things can be. And the more opportunities you have to make more money. So why the fuck wouldn't you do that? Especially if it comes with limited or no expense. Limited or no expense. Just astounding to me. It's absolutely astounding to me. I, I don't get it. 
you know, and I think that's the type of pro promotion. I think, again, I got away from your question a little bit there, man. But I hope you understand what I mean. It's great that they're on a sports center. You know, I guess that's all fine and good. But, you know, what about in the trenches, the nuts and bolts promoting? I think all these companies are severely lacking. Prototype Jack, if Triple H never got injured, what do you think would have happened? Do you think Jericho would have won the Undisputed title? I most certainly do not. That would have been fully set up for God himself. Praise God to be the first Undisputed champion. Oh, yeah. We're going to be Austin or Rock. We're most certainly going to be Triple H. Uh, Jimmy Purifoy, what do you think of all what's been going on with the Oscars, particularly when it comes to a possible boycott? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, let's be perfectly honest. You know, there's some serious questions there with the Oscars, the Academy Awards, in terms of who they nominate and why. I mean, but this speaks to the whole thing. I compare it to professional wrestling. Is... Hardcore fans will sit there and pump up these certain matches as being five-star classics that nobody fucking saw. It's a business that's about making money. So how is it a five-star match if 25 or 50 people damn paid to watch it? On the flip side, you have this match in front of 30, 40, 50,000 or more people, and people will crap all over it, but maybe it was the match that drew the people there, but that's a minus five stars! But not only those two performers, but everybody else got paid on the card in part because of that, in large part, frankly, because of that match. What's the better match? The better match, to me, is the one that makes the most money because it is a business about making money. And at the end of the day, movies are about making money. You don't do them just to make good movies. You try to make good movies that make money. And typically, you see this shit with the Oscars. So many movies, frankly, that nobody gives a fuck about and nobody watches and we hype up, there gets all this hype up from the critics. The critics love it. They go sit there and slather themselves up in popcorn butter and go, oh, Andy Reid is fantastic. Michael Fassbender is phenomenal in jobs. Give a fuck. Who saw these goddamn movies? You know, I mean, seriously. The whole thing about, you know, no black actors being nominated in any of the major categories. You know, frankly, I'm just saying myself, I haven't seen enough movies this year, this past year in 2015, to be able to judge whether there were people that were actually slighted or just in this particular year there was no black actor or actress that did a good enough job to be one of the five that was nominated in each category. A person should not be nominated just because they're white. On the same token, somebody should not be nominated just because they are black. Boycotting it because there are no black performers to me is kind of silly anyways because how many of these people frankly give a fuck about the Oscars? Any goddamn wings. I mean, why are we giving so much relevancy to frankly an irrelevant process? I mean, after all of these years, I think Leonardo DiCaprio still hasn't won an Academy Award. You would think at some point in time he would have stumbled into one of them motherfuckers. But Daniel Day-Lewis, I think, has won three of them. And yes, he's a great actor, but how many of his movies actually make real big bang at the box office? I mean, seriously. It's just, it's like the Smarks of Hollywood. That's what the fuck the Academy Awards is all about. It's the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. It's some internal mark bullshit. That's exactly what the fuck it is. So frankly, I could care less one way or another. For all those white people that were outraged about the Wiz being an all-black show, well, you got your revenge. The Oscars were so white. And for all those black folks that were happy about the Wiz being all-black and saying, yeah, this represents so many things, well, you got the Oscars, bitches. <laughs> Fucking, in this particular case, it just speaks to entirely deeper systematic issues and frankly in my opinion a lot of people are fucking clowns on it on all sides of the fence. Chris Taylor, best defense besides the 85 Bears. Um for an extended period of time, many people point to the steel curtain of the Steelers in the 70s, and that would be a great way to go. Um, in terms of single season defense, some will point to the 2000 Ravens, and that's another really good defense to go with. Some might point to the 2013 Seattle Seahawks especially what, what they did in the Super Bowl to the most prolific single-season offense in NFL history. And frankly, again, I could kind of understand that, too. I don't know if I have one. I might side with the Steel Curtain defense of the 70s because they won four Super Bowls. So not a single-season unit, but more over an extended period of time. 
Uh, Greg Owens, I live at home at 23, but I pitch in for the house. Am I considered a loser? No, nor do I think you should be, as long as you help pay some of the bills in the house. I mean, there are plenty of people that live at home until their mid or late 20s. And frankly, in today's environment, I don't know where you live. I don't even know if you live in the U.S. or not. But I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. There are times where I moved out as soon as I graduated high school at 18. You know, there are times that I wish the situation would have been different where I could have lived with my, one of my parents for another several years. You know, I couldn't live with my mom anymore, and I didn't want to live with my dad, so I did what I did. And there were positives and negatives that came out of that and arose out of that. So were there situations where I would have preferred to, especially if it would have, in, if it would have allowed me to go to college and go all the way through college and get my damn degree? Yes, and I would have loved to do that. You know, but you know, it'd be different if you weren't working and you weren't pitching in around the house. You were doing absolutely nothing and you're living at home. Then, yes, you're a fucking bum. I'm not going to call you a bum because, frankly, I've seen a lot of people in their 30s and 40s that have had to go back and live in a home because it shit's up tough out there for some. It really, really is. And then he also asked, why do girls like the bad boys and not the good, honest guys? Because, frankly, if I'm being honest, the good, honest guys are pussies. Women don't like spineless jellybacks, as I would call them. Like a jellyfish, no spine. They don't want a pussy. They want a dude that will actually be firm and confident in himself. You know when a woman really likes something? And this, is, this speaks to the fascination that is the female creature. It really does. And the, the, the built-in contradictions of them. Similar to men in different ways, too. Um, but women are the ultimate to me of walking contradictions. And... Trying to frankly understand women from a male perspective, how the fuck are you even going to manage to do that? Societies have been trying to do that for millennia and still can't get that shit right. I can give you my best opinion, but for all I know, it could be completely fucking wrong. Girls like bad boys because it's that element of danger, it's that element of intrigue, that element of keeping things interesting. It's also, I can change him, I can mold him, he's like putty, I can make him who I want. A good, honest guy, yeah, that's nice, but that's kind of dull. That's boring. He reminds me of the type of guy that my parents would want me to marry and have children with and, you know, be a stepford wife and all this other crap. So those bad boys are interesting. Those bad boys are entertaining. And those bad boys piss me off so bad when they sit there and go against me and talk back to me and tell me this is how it is. It gets me so frustrated. I get wet in my panty region and I want to have the babies immediately. There's like a lot of things in this world, my man. It doesn't make any real fucking logical sense. You'll hear it all the time. Dudes complaining about certain types of women that they date, always doing the same fucking thing to them. Then look for a different type of woman. Women. Well, this dude's bad, da, da, da. you know, and you, you have the ones that have three kids by three different men, but it's always the men's fault. No, bitch, at some point in time, look in the fucking mirror, and what the fuck are you doing to drive these dudes away? This hell, I'm doing it on my own. Ah, oh, fuck you. Shit. It, it, but it's impossible to fully figure out, and if anybody pretends like they figured it out, they haven't, because frankly, women don't even fucking know what women want most of the time. Diplonious game, do you see T TNA surviving in... Uh, throughout 2016, yes, that's the number one skill is surviving, not thriving or making a bunch of money, but they have an ability to, su to, to survive. They really do, and they really, really do. All right, it looks like that's good enough for the questions uh, for this week's Q&A. Thanks again so much to all of you that took to Twitter and tweeted your questions to me. I'll be back with an holy shit, one almost 25 minutes. Fuck! Bob Saget! That's enough of this shit.